Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, O you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Mm. You're most welcome to stand as you're able.
Jesus, Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves, he does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Join me as we speak out our faith together here in this place. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Amen. Good morning, church. So I spent the weekend with all of my mom's family, and it was a great time. We had so much fun. Um, But one thing that we were kind of all just me and my sister and my cousins were all talking around at the lunch table is they all have small children. And most of them are around, the oldest of the group are all around four, five, six years old. And so they've started teaching them about grace. They've started teaching them about, you know, God gives us grace. We can give other people grace. So my cousin had a story. So they were teaching their son about grace. And he had done a lot of things that day that had caused him to lose dessert. But they were going to a friend's birthday party. And she really didn't feel like, you know, how can I tell him he can't have the cupcake that everybody else at this birthday party is going to have cupcakes at? And it's a party, and we're going to have fun. And, you know, so she was like, I felt like that was a great opportunity to show him grace. Like, yes, you have done these things. We're going to work on being better. But because this activity is happening today, because we are doing this, I'm going to show you grace. And she thought she'd done a great job of explaining it to him. 
Well, the next day, he goes and does all these things and loses dessert again. And she tells him, okay, you're not going to get dessert today. And he goes, well, but mama, can't you just show me a little bit of grace today? And the next time she tells him something, oh, but mama, you could show me a little bit of grace. And then the next time, oh, but mama, you could show me a little bit of grace. But, you know, isn't that a lot of times, sometimes how we feel like, eh, we don't have to worry about it. We can do whatever we want because God's going to give us grace. Because God forgives us no matter what we do, and he's going to show us grace so we don't have to worry about it. But, you know, it really isn't about just doing whatever you want because God's going to forgive you. It's about doing what God wants you to do. And when you mess up, he shows you the grace. It's not about, yeah, I don't have to worry about it. God's got it taken care of. It's, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And then if I stumble through that, he's going to give me the grace for that. I just thought it was so cool that even though they're four and five and six, that their parents are still right now teaching them what grace is about. And even as an adult, sometimes we need a refresher about what grace is. So I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to challenge you this week to show somebody in your life some grace. Maybe it can teach them a little bit about what Jesus meant when he says he forgives us and he gives us grace. So if you'll bow your heads. Dear God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. And we thank you so much for the forgiveness and the grace that you show us every day, even when we don't deserve it, God. Um, And we thank you for that, and we love you for that. But also we love that you remind us constantly that it's not just about whatever we can do, but it's about what you want us to do. It's about whatever you want us to do to bring the kingdom here, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. morning. How are you all today? Are you good? Okay, tell your faces. (laughs) That was supposed to be humorous, okay? (laughs) Way to go, buddy. (laughs) At least somebody got it. uh, uh, I'm so glad you're here today. Uh, just as we gather together to worship God and to give praise to Him, and and I'm glad you're excited about what God is doing in our midst and and how God is moving in your life and in the life of the congregation, and also uh, the move of God in our city to bring revival and renewal in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, let's just take a moment and uh, lift up our request to God, and uh, I'll be praying. You can pray too. He won't be confused. Um, Your neighbor might be, but God won't be, okay? So uh, let's just take this opportunity and, and voice something to the Lord. You know, even if it's, I love you, Lord, he probably will answer back, I love you too. Father, we do thank you that you are a God who loves us so much. And that you've given so much grace to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so, Father, we worship you and we adore you. We lift up our hearts to you and magnify your name and are thankful for all that you have done for us and how you have accomplished great things in our midst, Father. And, Lord, that you are the God who who heals us, who brings renewal, who sends the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we rejoice in Jesus Christ, our Savior, in the Holy Spirit, and in you, Father, for your love and watch care in our lives. Lord, we we lift up one another in prayer and ask, Father, uh, for one another that your Spirit would uh, help our hearts to to move closer to you in everything that we do. And that, Father, uh, this church, this body of Christ here called First Methodist, that, Lord, you would minister powerfully in the midst and show yourself powerful in signs and wonders. And, Lord, we thank you for that and healing. And, Lord, we just thank you that this is a church, Father, I thank you that this is a church that prays for one another and lifts one another up in our needs and ministers powerfully in the power of your spirit, Lord, with love and grace and mercy. And so, Father, we just praise you again and give you thanks. 
Father, we pray for our city. And th there are so many people out there who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. The, the fields are white unto harvest. And so, Father, I pray to you, the Lord of the harvest, to send your workers out into the fields to bring in the souls, Lord. And so we thank you for that, Father, for a great opening up of uh, commitment to Jesus Christ and new life in Christ. And, Lord, that... Uh, these people seated right here today are going to be the ones who share the good news of Jesus Christ with people they don't even know yet and bring them in, Father, because they're hungry and thirsty and they need a Savior. Lord, we pray for our nation. We, we lift up President Biden and Vice President Harris and the cabinet and the House and the Senate and the leadership there and the Supreme Court and uh, our state, our governor and lieutenant governor and the legislature and the courts and here in our county and in our city, we, we pray for our elected officials and lift them before you and ask that you move powerfully in their lives, Father. We know, Lord, that... Uh, even if they're not serving you, you can still direct their hearts and move them in a direction that uh, you would have them go. And so, Father, we lift them up to you, asking that, Father, you would accomplish your purposes in this nation and state and county and city and in this church. And we thank you for that. We, we pray for our first responders, Father, for our... Uh, state troopers and our sheriff's department and our local police and the marshals and and we pray for the firemen and uh, the EMTs and the emergency room staff and the doctors and nurses and Lord we lift them up to you all the hospital staff Father Lord just be present and powerful in the midst uh, the, the mission of our hospital here is all about Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we, we pray for that and uh, ask, Lord, that your spirit fill those halls with your very presence, a presence to heal and to restore and renew. And, Lord, we thank you for all of those things. And, Father, we pray for those who are serving in the armed forces, and we lift them up, uh, those who are here at our Air Force Base, and, and Lord, those who are in places of armed conflict, we pray for them and ask that your spirit be present and powerful there. Draw these young men and women to you, Father. And Lord, let there be someone be bold enough to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, for those things, we thank you. And Lord, we pray about this pandemic and Lord we thank you that uh, there's vaccinations that can be had but Lord uh, that you would move in powerful ways to bring healing and wholeness as only you can Father and for that we give you praise and thanks Lord and in all these things we worship you and bow down before you in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior who said when you pray pray like this our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Amen. Again, uh, we'll receive an offering, but uh, you can put it in the box here, the one in the back, and on your way out if you haven't put it in already. But we, uh, I give thanks to the Lord for your faithfulness in giving and ask that uh, the blessing of God Almighty be upon you for your faithfulness. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love.
Clap for the singing, clap for the Lord. (laughs) Hallelujah. Our uh, scripture today comes from Romans chapter 6. The good news is that I'm going to read it all. I'm just not going to preach everything I came up with, okay? Okay. Because lunch is coming. All right, so Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. I kind of like the King James version there. God forbid. I think he doesn't want us to do that. What do you think? Okay. Uh, It wasn't a rhetorical question. (laughs) God forbid, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, 
If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let the sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves... You are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Any slaves to righteousness out there? The rest of you aren't sure. <laughs> I put this in human terms because you're, you're weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. And when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness, What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God and the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the results is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me and for me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You know, there is a saying that's attributed to Francis of Assisi, Um, that I think a lot of people have heard uh, and it goes something like this and I don't think Francis actually said this but you know what can I say Um, preach the gospel and if you must use words have you ever heard that no you haven't heard that before okay well then it's news to some of you All right. well here's the deal what he was saying is my interpretation, make your actions match your heart. Do the things that God has called you to do, and that will give you an opening to actually talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. Now, I I want you to know that throughout the scripture, it talks about the idea that um, the world is watching you and me. Did you know that? Now, often they're watching to see if you slip up, right? So they can go, aha, you preach the gospel to me and you behave that and you call yourself a Christian, right? Have you ever heard that? Yeah, uh, not a fun thing. But so what Paul is talking about here is his look. God has done some stuff for us and you need to do some stuff in response to that. That makes sense, doesn't it? 
So let's look at that a minute. See, there, there, there are two distinct parts to this life of joy, this joyful Christian life that I've been talking about and will be talking about probably all summer long. But the Lord's part, okay, and our part. Did you know you had a part in that joyful Christian life? And so what does the Lord do and, and what are you and I supposed to do? In the Bible, we have presented to us a Savior able to save us from the power of sin as really as he saves us from the guilt. And so what that's, you don't have to feel bad about your sins anymore because Jesus forgave you. But then here's the other thing. You don't have to keep doing them because he saved you from the power of that thing. So that thing no longer has power or control in your life. You're set free, free indeed. So, our Savior is able to save us from the power of our sins as really as he saves us from the guilt. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, uh, for us to know God is not merely to know facts about God and his nature. Okay? Rather, it is so to participate in his life that his nature and character become ours. Why do you think you're called Christians? Do you know what that word meant originally? Little Christ. What God does versus what we do is woven within Romans 6, and Paul insists God has himself accomplished a decisive break with sin. Look, we died to sin. Uh, Our old self was crucified with him. We are dead to sin but alive to God. We have been brought from death to life. Sin shall not be your master. You have been set free from sin and become slaves of righteousness. And you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. That's what God did for us. And so interspersed within these things that God has done for us are imperatives. Now, do you know what an imperative is? It's a command. Do this. Did did you notice that it's not the 10 suggestions? It's the 10 commands. All throughout the Bible, there are commands. If you've been reading Deuteronomy lately, uh, Moses, I think every other paragraph says, now, if you do this, God's going to bless you. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. So do this. So, Interspersed there are these imperatives making us responsible for winning the battle against sin. Do not let sin reign. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin, but offer yourself to God. Offer the parts of your body in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Those are things that we're required to do. Clear back in the book of Genesis when Cain and Abel, what did he say? Look, sin is lurking at the door and wants to destroy you. You have a decision to make. Now here's the good news. God gives us dessert. Not our just desserts. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was free. But see, here's the problem, is that we ignore one of these interrelated ideas at the expense of the other. Often, however, we focus on one and downplay or forget the other, which is a crucial mistake. Both things are necessary. Both need to be held in tension as a unity of thought and action. For what we do grows out of what God has done for us. What we do grows out of what God has done for us. Just to sum it up very briefly, our part is to trust. And trust involves a whole lot of stuff. Uh, Obedience, humility, 
And God's part is to do the work. You see, there's a certain work to be accomplished, and we're to be delivered from not only the guilt of sin, but also from the power of sin, and are to be made perfect in every good work to do the will of God. We are to be actually transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And so uh, this Spirit of God, this Holy Spirit that we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, must be active and powerful in each of our lives to accomplish the things that God is speaking into them. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and then we'll be able to prove or test uh, what God's perfect will is. Uh, A real work is to be worked in us and upon us. Habitual sins are to be conquered. Now, don't raise your hand, but anybody have some trouble with some of that stuff? Okay, if you do, keep your seat. Okay, so, uh, and I say that because uh, we all have things that set us off and we go in a wrong direction, okay? That's, but God wants us to overcome those things so that we can be uh, vehicles, if you will, of his grace in a world that needs grace, And so there's a real work that is worked in us and upon us. And so habitual sins are conquered. Evil habits are to be overcome. Wrong dispositions and feelings are to be rooted out. And holiness of thought, emotion, and actions are to be formed in us. A holy transformation is to take place. And this is what the Bible teaches us. Now, somebody must do this. You know... We must do it for ourselves or somebody else has to do it for us. And most of us have tried to do it for ourselves. I'll raise my hand. And failed. Then we discover from the scriptures and from our own experience, it is something we are unable to do. But the Lord Jesus Christ has come on purpose to do it, and he will do it for all who put themselves wholly into his hands and trust him without reserve. For the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. And so under these circumstances, what is our part as believers and what is the part of the Lord? And plainly, you and I can do nothing but trust while the Lord in whom we trust actually does the work entrusted to him. The reason that we are more than conquerors is because when we trust him, he gives us grace to do what he's called us to do. And trusting and doing are certainly two different things. And in this joyful life intended for us, the joyful life is intended for us. Our part is to trust and God's part is to do the thing entrusted to him. Our part is surrender and obedience and trust because this is positively all that we can do. There is another part to be done and it is accomplished by God's spirit working in us. When we trust the Lord works, actual results are reached by our trusting because our Lord takes un, because our Lord undertakes the things entrusted to him and accomplishes them. We do not do anything, but he does it. And it is all the more effectively done because of this. The Lord's part is to do the things entrusted to him. Lord, I'm trusting you with my anger. You might name something. Whatever it is. You know, be angry and sin not. Sometimes I forget. So I trust him with that. And then in those moments, God gives me grace so I can be an overcomer. Not just a conqueror, but an overcomer. So I can have a new perspective.
Look, God disciplines us. Anybody been disciplined by the Lord? Because if you haven't, you you got something wrong with your connection with him because he disciplines those that he loves. And he trains by inward exercise and outward providence. He brings to bear upon us all the refining and purifying resources of his wisdom and love. He makes everything in our lives and circumstances subservient to the one great purpose of causing us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And of conforming us day to day, hour by hour, and sometimes minute by minute to the image of Christ. For We know in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. He carries us through a process of transformation. Longer or shorter for some of us, depending upon our peculiar cases, may require making actual and experience the results for which we have trusted. How? How does that happen? We surrender Does anyone know Ulysses S. Grant? Heard of him? Uh, there's a couple of you that might have known him. But um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, he, Lincoln was after in the Civil War a general who would fight. And General McClellan was a good general, but he was a little timid around the edges. And so finally he got Grant in there, and uh, he did lots of things. But... Uh, they changed his, instead of Ulysses Simpson, they called him Unconditional Surrender Grant. Because that's the only way he was letting them surrender, unconditionally. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to surrender to his spirit unconditionally. Wow! What a revelation! And we resist that, right? I mean, what could happen? It could be joyful. That was free too. You see, we have dared, for instance, according to the commands of Romans 6, 11, to count ourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And the Lord makes this a reality and puts us to death by a thousand little mortifications and crosses to the natural man. And our salvation is available only because God makes it real. You see... We surrender, we trust, and we obey God. And God pours more grace into our lives so that we can obey. Because you see, it's by grace that we have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so if we are saved by faith through grace, by grace through faith, then all of our life should be a life of faith and grace. Now look, this takes both a step of faith and a process of works. Uh, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And it is a step of surrender and trust on our part. And it is a process of development on God's part. By a a step of faith, we get into Christ. And by a process, we are made to grow up into him, into all things. Um, Look, then we will be no longer be infants tossed to and fro. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ from him. The whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. All of us 
are needed to accomplish God's purposes here in this church, in this community, working together in love. You see, by a step of faith, we put our hands into the divine potter. And by a gradual process, he makes us into a vessel unto his own honor, made holy and useful to the master and prepared to do every good work. What can be said about our part in this work? But we must continually surrender ourselves and continually trust. And when it comes to God's side of the question, what is there that uh, may not be said as to the many and wonderful ways in which he accomplishes the work entrusted to him? We've all experienced that in our lives and continue to experience that as he molds us and shapes us into his very image It is here the growing comes in. A lump of clay could never grow into a beautiful vessel if it stayed in the clay pits for a thousand years. But when it is put into the hands of a skillful potter, it grows rapidly under his fashioning into the vessel he intends it to be. And on the same way, the soul abandoned to the working of the heavenly potter, the master, and prepared to do any good work. You see, it's like this. James talked about this in chapter 4. But he, God, gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if you will humble yourself before the Lord, he will lift you up. But sometimes we get proud and arrogant and shake our fist at God and say that's not happening and then God just laughs, laughs and works with us you know I, I worked in a potter shop and uh, I saw him take the clay and before he could turn it into something he had to put it on the wheel and manipulate it and put it into all different kinds of shapes and forms to soften it up and get it ready to be turned into what he was going to make out of it that's what we're experiencing the loving care of God putting us in all kinds of contortions so that we can be a useful vessel you see maturity cannot be reached in a moment and it's not something that's chronological but is the result of God's work, God's Holy Spirit, who uh, by his engineering and transforming power causes us to grow up into Christ in all things. We cannot hope to reach this maturity in any other way than by yielding ourselves up utterly and willingly to his mighty working. The sanctification the scripture urges as a present experience on all of us who believe does not consist of maturity and growth, but in purity of heart. You see, a lump of clay from the moment it comes under the transforming hand of the potter is uh, during each day and each hour of the process just what the potter wants it to be at that hour or on that day, and therefore it pleases him. So even though we are a work in progress, the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in our life is pleasing to God our Father. Because we're opening ourselves up and allowing God to do his work. And we're responding to the grace that he has given us. But you see, when you first start, it's far from being matured into the vessel he intends in the future to make it. But still in his mind, if you will, He sees what he is making us into. For we will all be transformed into the image of Christ. And so uh, you have opportunity to uh, cooperate with what the Holy Spirit is doing or uh, be brought along, grabbed by the ear, kicking and dragging all the way. So you have a choice on how you'd like that to happen. But God's works are perfect in every stage of their growth. 
All we claim then in this life of sanctification, this joyful Christian life, is by an act of faith we put ourselves into the hands of the Lord for him to work in all, uh, us all, the good pleasure of his will, and then by continuous exercise of faith, keep ourselves there. This is our part in the matter. It's that old hymn, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. When we do, and while we do, we are in a scripture sense, truly pleasing to God Although it may take years of training and discipline to mature us into a vessel that shall be in all respects to his honor and fitted to every good work. Our part is trusting. It is his to accomplish the results. When we do our part, he never fails to do his, for no one ever trusted in the Lord and was put to shame. Trust is the beginning and the continuing foundation. But when we trust, when we have faith, the Lord works. And his work is the important part of the whole matter. In yielding or offering ourselves unto God and and our members, our bodies as instruments of righteousness unto him, we find he works in us to will and to act according to his good purposes then we can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. In the divine order, God's working depends upon our cooperation. Our Lord is, it was declared that at a certain place, now listen to this, At a certain place, he could do there no mighty works because of their unbelief or their lack of faith. It wasn't that he didn't want to do something, but he could not. And too often, we think God will not, when the real truth is, he cannot. Just as the potter, however skillful, cannot make a beautiful vessel out of a lump of clay that is never put into his hands, so neither can God make out of me a vessel unto his honor unless I put myself into his hands. My part is the essential correlation of God's part in the matter of my salvation. And as God is sure to do his part all right, the vital thing for me to find out is what my part is and then to do it. You see, righteousness has a moral sense. Conduct pleasing to God. In other words, there's a moral sense, an activity What we do should be pleasing to God. The victory over sin God has won for us in Christ is a victory that must be appropriated by faith. Putting away the sins, plaguing us. Putting away the sins plaguing us will not be an automatic uh, process. Something happening without cooperation. Scripture insists A determination of our own will is called for to turn what God has done in Christ for you and me into actuality. Let me share a verse with you so that you can hear that from the scripture. Therefore, do not let, therefore you, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Only by constantly looking at ourselves as people who really have died to sin and been made alive in Christ will we be able to live out our new status as children of God. 
And so this series of of sermons concerning the joyful Christian life is going to focus on what's our part. How to get there. Some difficulties along the way and the wonderful things that God does in the process. And so uh, I want to make plain for us how we are to fulfill our part of this great work. And I want to make it plain that I believe with all my heart in God's effectual working in our lives. God is working in your life and my life even now by his spirit. And unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. Amen? I'm done preaching now, sister. (laughs) All right, we're going to sing about resurrection power. Y'all stand up.
from our Lord Jesus Christ to each and every one of us. Go forth in peace. The love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.